Let us pray. May all of our thoughts and our silences, the words and the spaces between the words, be filled with your Spirit, O God, our light and our Redeemer. Amen. A cynic once said that Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and what we got was the church. And it is easy to be cynical about the church, just as it's easy to heap scorn on any human institution if we want to. You see, by definition, any organization established by people filled with people, led by people, is going to be human. With all the wonder and all of the problems that, that that implies. And that's not for one moment to excuse the horrible things done by the church, or by people in the church, or by people in the name of God. It's simply part of the reality. But we often seem to forget that while the foundation of the church may be Jesus Christ crucified and risen, the walls and the furniture of the place are very, very human. Now, in this series of sermons during Lent, what we're doing is is we're making an assumption. We're we're trying to get you ready to uh, be out in the world. And our assumption is that a friend, and that friend could be a neighbor, a relative, a colleague, it could even be your own soul. But a friend has come to you with questions that we might call generally spiritual questions. They've looked at you, they see that you're a a trustworthy sort of person, you're good to talk to, and they've come to you with, with some big questions. We've looked at questions of suffering and of God, And and one of the things that we've seen is that our first reaction should not be to get defensive. You know, sometimes somebody asks us a difficult question and we get all tensed up and we want to have the one right answer. Take a breath. Chill out. Calm down. You don't have to be defensive. You don't have to have the one right answer. What we want to do is create a space, a psychological and a spiritual space, to make somebody welcome. These are big questions. They deserve more than a quick answer. They deserve time and space. We want to, if you like, create an atmosphere in which the conversation can go on. And it's okay to say, I have questions too. Or, I don't know the answer. Let's, Let's... Let's explore that together. And so today we're, we're wondering, you know, your friend knows that you attend church. And they come to you and, and they might ask a question, why is the church such a mess? Or even, well, maybe less bluntly, why do we, why do we need the church? Or because church and organized religion often get mushed together, they might ask you, well, what good is religion anyway? Remember, you're going to take a deep breath. And it's always good to be honest. It's good to acknowledge that there is a long list of, of things in the history of the church and of organized religion of which we are less than proud. We need to repent and lament. But honesty also requires balancing the scales and to say that, well, you know, that's all true. And I don't need to give you that list. You know what that list is. We hear it all the time. But on the other side, you might consider the fact that even into the last century and modern universities, knowledge, wisdom, learning was preserved by the church, encouraged by the church, fostered by the church, when no other organization in society was interested. Some of the greatest early scientists were, in fact, Christian folk, seeking to demonstrate 
the wonder of God's creation for God's people. So, so that's one example. And you might talk about hospitals and clinics and, and other health organizations and hospices established and run and maintained by Christians, sometimes in cultures which seem to have no particular interest in caring for the ill. That's also part of the story. You could talk about political action and support groups and refugee services and food banks and all manner of activities undertaken by the church. You might talk about how art and music through the centuries has often been inspired by and for a lot of cases financed by the church. And you know, you might surprise the person who asked you the question because a lot of people are genuinely unaware that there is some good news in all of that tide of bad. So you've started the, the conversation. But why is the, the church necessary? Well, the church is necessary because you won't find the Christian story of God in nature or in your heart. I know people love to tell me how they, how they encounter God uh, looking at a waterfall or on the 8th fairway. But the, the reality is that you won't find in either nature or in the human heart the story of a God who loves humanity so much as to take on this human form, who loves us so much to follow even to a torturous and brutal death, who says no to powers of injustice and evil so strongly as in the resurrection. So if a, if a waterfall... Or a, or a particular green, or a particular act of human kindness inspires in you thoughts of the God whom we meet in Jesus Christ, the truth is that somebody, somewhere, sometime, told you that story. You didn't dream it up. You had to learn it somewhere. And the role of the church is to keep that story of Jesus alive in word and in deed so that it is not lost. And that's one of the reasons why the church is necessary. And sure, the church is a human institution with all that goes along with that. But I hate to break it to you. No movement ever survived the death of its founder. No movement in history ever survived the death of its founder without creating some sort of structure. It just doesn't happen. You see, when the founder is around, he or she can answer all the questions, solve all the difficulties, keep people from squabbling with one another, say where we ought to go next. When the founder is gone, you have to find a way to answer those questions if the movement is going to continue. It's not just the church, it's everywhere. And unfortunately, people being people, our structures tend to grow. We like to create organizations and gather power, and we're very human. And the keep it simple stupid, the KISS principle may work for presentations and ideas. It doesn't seem to work very well in human organizations. But having said all of that, your friend might still look at you and ask, well, you've arrived in the church. You've been added to some sort of membership role. That means you've made it, right? Uh, no. What you've discovered is the profound human truth of the two types of people in the world. Those who need help and know it, and those who need help and haven't figured it out yet. You've joined the first group. Congratulations. That, that's a big step. You're now on the journey. But being part of the church does not make you particularly profound or particularly righteous. And it certainly doesn't mean that God loves you any more. You're on the journey. Welcome. 
Ah, well, this is getting to be quite the conversation. I hope you have a long lunch hour. Well, next your friend might say to you, but the church is full of petty, egotistical, hypocritical, gossiping, and unkind people, to which you might be tempted to reply, come on in, there's always room for one more. <laughs> but that might not be so helpful. The truth is that whenever the church gives the impression that those in the church are somehow morally or spiritually superior, we are in fact selling short the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, we should be striving to live to his command. Yes, we should be trying to live as he calls us. Yes, we should be trying to love God neighbor, and self, and no, two out of three ain't good enough. But whenever we feel that we've managed to reach his standard, our response should be gratitude. Our response should be gratitude, not pride. And so, if that's the church, with all its reality and all its problems, your friend may still be sitting there looking at you and saying, you seem like such a reasonable, rational, normal individual. I don't see any horns growing. I don't see a particular halo. Why do you participate in the church? Well, I hope you have an answer ready for that question. The letter to Peter says, Always be ready to give an answer to those who ask you about the hope that is in you, but do so with gentleness and respect. What would your answer be to somebody who asked you about what you hope in and why you hope? So you'll have your specific answers, but here's a couple of gen general ones. The church exists for the praise of God. If God is, if God truly is, God deserves praise for so many reasons. The reality is, though, and this is honest confession, the reality is that we often get involved in so many good and necessary and demanding and rewarding activities that we sometimes forget that the praise of God is what actually brings us in here. To praise God and to be built up as Jesus' own. Following Jesus at any time, in any place, is tough stuff. We constantly need to be learning about it, practicing it, witnessing others as they live it. I, I like to think of the church more as a music studio or a dance studio or a martial arts dojo than a regular school. Because it's not a matter of listening to learned lectures and amassing knowledge in our head. It's a matter of practicing. Practicing what we learn. Practicing what we are called to. To come into this place and look at fellow worshipers and see their examples of Christ-likeness that you and I can follow. That's what the church is supposed to be. We not only learn, but we practice and we witness the practice of others. Now here's a tough one for many of us. The church exists to serve others. Anglican Archbishop William Temple once wrote, the church is the largest organization in the world that exists for the service of non-members. Do you think that the church exists to serve you? I'm speaking, this is sort of in-house stuff, so if you're a guest with us today, ex excuse me while I talk to the, the folks who are regularly here. Do you think that the church exists to serve you and to keep us happy? Well, if that's your attitude, then we might as well shut the doors now and put us all out of our misery because we have taken the church of Jesus Christ, which is meant for the service of the world, and we have turned it into something for our own good. 
and the church of Jesus Christ gets into its greatest failings and its deepest sins when we forget that all of this is primarily for the service of others. What am I saying? If you look at the mission statement of this congregation, it says that we are here to show the love of God by being like Jesus. And as I reminded you last year, I didn't write that. The congregation here wrote that. To show the love of God by being like Jesus. That's not warm and fuzzy and intangible or theoretical. The love of God is grounded in reality. It's real in the lives of others. As a result, the one goal of the church to which we ought to subordinate everything else is to raise up people who will live that love, live the way of justice, the way of peace, the way of the Spirit, the way of the kingdom, the way of Jesus. That should be the aim of each and everything that we do because if it isn't, how else do we justify our existence? If we don't live that love to which God calls us and which Jesus demonstrated to us, how are we any different from any organization in in society? And if we don't live that love, maybe your friend is right. What use is the church. And so listen, if you would, to these words of the Apostle Paul. They are often read at weddings, but if you knew the people to whom Paul was writing, you would know that this is far more than wedded love or romantic love. Love here is the tough love of Jesus. It's the love that is based in a decision of the mind reinforced by a resolution of the will and expressed in word and deed that acts for the good of the other, speaks for the the good of the other, wills for the good of the other, prays for the good of the other in all circumstances. The church should be the school of that kind of love. A love that is patient. A love that is kind. A love that is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist upon its own way, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Such love never ends. Now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of them, is love. That's what the church is for. Let those with ears hear the Spirit's word to the church. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your call into this community of worship and service and love. Help us to be open to a spiritually questing society. Give us the words to speak, but more important, the grace to welcome those who turn to us. May we know that we speak not for ourselves, but for the one who calls us. And may we speak with his words of love. And now unto God in Christ Jesus be all honor and glory, might, majesty, and dominion, the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.